It's terrific to be with you today, and it sounds like you have an absolutely wonderful program of activities that you began yesterday and that will continue through till tomorrow. Uh, I'm very glad to speak to you because I, I don't usually get a chance to talk to an audience of people with the kind of time horizon that you have, uh, partly because you're young and you're going to be alive, most of you, for quite some time. Uh, probably, you know, out towards the end of the century. But also because of your, your professional interests. Uh, planners don't think so much about things that happen tomorrow or next week. They're interested in things that happen five years, ten years, generations, and even centuries from now. In fact, the, the, uh, the things that you do in your profession, the planning, laying down uh, settlement patterns and infrastructure, uh, thinking about how we're going to generate our energy and how it's going to be distributed, how our food is going to be grown and how it's going to be distributed and where it's going to be sold, how the populations are going to be spread out across the landscape and how they're going to move from one place to another, from where they live to where they work. This, this uh, in a sense, blueprint that is laid out across the landscape uh, it determines much of, of how we live for literally centuries into the future. So you, but just by virtue of your profession, you have this extremely long time horizon. Now one thing that we know from what's going on in the world is that nothing is static anymore. And I noticed that the title of your, your conference is emphasizing the concept of resilience. And the thing about resilience is it's this idea that you have to be nimble, you have to be responsive, you have to be able to cope with sudden surprise and change all the time. And there does seem to be a little bit of a tension between the idea of planning and the idea of resilience. In fact, I would say that resilient planning might almost be an oxymoron. I don't know whether you've, you've had much conversation about this. Because on one side, you're dealing with things that are going to be in place for a long time. And almost by virtue of, of that fact, they're relatively static, locked in place. And on the other side, when you're talking about resilience, you're, you're thinking about responding nimbly to change and adapting and changing all the time in response to the surprises and the vagaries of our world. And, uh, and, and I think that's a really fundamental challenge that you're going to face. This notion of resilience is really important. You need to bring it into your understanding of what planning is about. But reconciling planning with resilience is probably a lot harder than it would first seem. So uh, I'm going to make that case in a little bit more detail over the next 40 minutes or so. And uh, I want to start with uh, a pop quiz. Hold on, I'm supposed to point this in this direction. So my pop quiz is, does it work? There we go. Good. Uh, how many of you recognize this? Put your hands up. How many? Read. Up, 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 up. Uh, so maybe 15, 20? This is not the deep past. This is the Macondo BP Transocean rig blowout in the Gulf uh, last April. And this is actually just a few minutes before the rig sank on April 22nd. Uh, you see at the bottom there, 22nd, 1451, 251 in the afternoon. Now, first of all, it's kind of interesting that not many people remember this. If I'd shown this image probably a couple weeks after, the rig sank, or while the well was still spewing its five million barrels of oil into the Gulf, uh, probably I would have had 50% of the people in the audience. There's something about our world today which is sort of piling one thing on top of another. Uh, one surprise after another, now we're all transfixed by what's happening in Egypt or, or, or whatever. That it seems, it seems like something that happened not even a year ago is the deep past. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised by surprise, because our world seems to be full of it now. That Macondo rig, that Macondo well in the BP Transocean rig, was not supposed to go down. Experts were telling us that that kind of thing just won't happen, or if they admitted it might happen, they sort of suggested that it was infinitesimally small probability. And there it happened. And now it turns out we realize it actually is a lot more likely that kind of thing is going to happen than we were being told at the time by the experts. And in one domain after another, whether it's with our food supply or our energy supply systems or the possibility of spread of 
epidemic disease around the world, or as we've learned in the last few years with the global economic system, things that looked really improbable turn out to be much more likely to happen. And in fact, there are a lot of things that we aren't even thinking about that just seem to come out of the blue. It turns out our world is full of what you might call unknown unknowns. You may have remember that, that term was used once by the Secretary of Defense in the United States, Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, and the idea is that when you're in a world or an environment of unknown unknowns, you don't even know what questions to ask. You're ignorant of your own ignorance. You don't have adequate enough understanding of the systems around you to even identify where you need to do more research to get more knowledge. That's a real challenge for us. It's a real challenge, I think, for planners who are trying to think about how to lay down the systems of human habitation and human production going out a century or more into the future. Well, why is it that the world is full of surprises now? I could go on at length about this. In fact, I'm going to teach a whole course on it. We don't want that today. But I would say that, that one of the critical things is that there are a whole bunch of stresses combining in our world simultaneously. In fact, you can take any one of those systems I mentioned, an energy system or a food system, a global economic system, and you can usually identify in each case that there are a whole bunch of things that are stressing that system or interfering with its operation simultaneously. And the way I think about this is that these problems are sort of converging, and they're multiplying each other's effect, which is why those multiplication signs are there. And the risk is that you're going to produce a situation of overload that the, base, that the institutions or the coping capacity of that particular system won't, won't be able to cope, and it will break down in some respect. Now, I understand that you're considering some of these problems at this conference. If I were to look at our global system, I would identify these five stresses as being particularly important. And in my last book, The Upside and Down, plug, uh, <laughs> I, I have a chapter on each one of these things because these are the macro stresses, what I call tectonic stresses. It's like tectonic plates moving under the surface of the, of the global socio-political, economic, ecological system. And pressures are building up and then may get released at various points in system-shattering earthquakes, to extend the metaphor. And each one of these things is worth a lot of attention. Uh, and each one will challenge your business and, and your, your uh, uh, professional success in being successful planners. I'm going to talk about only two today. I'm going to talk about energy, scarcity, and climate change. I'm going to say a few words on climate change and a few words on energy. And, and the point here is to uh, emphasize the, uh, the significance of shock and the possibility of shock, of sudden sharp change in our world that could have enormous implications for the way we design our lives on the landscape. But I want to also make this a more optimistic story about than just you know telling a story about all the scary things out there that are converging on us. Uh, I, I want to also suggest that those shocks, when they occur, because of these convergent pressures that create system breakdown at various points, that those crises that arise can be uh, moments of opportunity, times when we can actually uh, really shift the way we're doing things, because the current way of doing things has been discredited, that's what a crisis often is about, it's a discrediting of the current ways of doing things, that's what the last economic crisis was about. And, and that gives us an opening or an opportunity if we're prepared, and I want to underline if we're prepared, it means we need to think now about what we're going to do in those moments of crisis. Uh, gives us an opportunity for deep change, potentially, in our technologies, our institutions, and our behaviors. Don't let a good crisis go to waste, as the uh, economist Paul Romer said, and then it was picked up, of course, by the Obama administration during the last economic crisis. There's a way of thinking about this that I use to explain this notion of what you might call punctuated change in complex systems through time. So if you look at our societies, 